Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are at uh, 1045 AM. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to our president and CEO, Jim Matthews. Joe, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited about this next panel. Um, I have been, and, and the staff will tell you this uh, when you ask them, I have been beating this horse about uh, the return of travel and the return of, of travelers uh, really since uh, really last May. Uh, I, I, there was something about um, Governor Lamont's remark that uh, we were going to no longer worry about traveling post COVID because everyone was gonna stay home for the rest of their lives. I'm exaggerating a little, but that was the impression he created. And uh, boy, that stuck with me. And uh, I immediately wrote a, a blog post about that. And, um, and so now that folks are getting vaccinated and, and we're sort of starting to crack open uh, our, our nation's uh, transportation systems, um, I really think that this is a good time for us to have uh, this panel to talk through uh, what, uh, what the future looks like here in, for opening up and for, for bringing back our, mm -hmm. our travel networks. Um, I'm joined by, by three uh, folks who are uh, experts, uh, but I also very much uh, consider them all friends. Um, start with, uh, we, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll introduce each of you uh, as a panel and then I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll go from there. So uh, first uh, I'd like to, to welcome Joe McAndrew. Um, Joe was one of the first folks that I met uh, when I started working in this field uh, a few years ago. Uh, right now, he is the uh, director of, help me with this, I hope I get this right, the director of transportation policy at Greater Washington Partnership, um, which is a really cool idea. Uh, it's a civic partnership to bring together business and, and others to, to really uh, build the kind of 21st century uh, transportation uh, network that, that we really all need. Um, has a lot of background in, in politics and policy. And uh, I, I certainly consider him uh, a great resource, has been great help to us here in the association for many years. Um, welcome, Joe. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome my dear friend, Benet Wilson. Uh, Benet is now at The Points Guy, um, and she is. Uh, are you, I don't know if you've got your camera on there or not. I can't see on my little screen here. Uh, Benet uh, came from uh, a deep background in uh, aviation. Uh, she and I worked together for many years uh, at Aviation Week in various guises, um, but she is so much more than that. She is a leader in, uh, in all kinds of uh, fields uh, from aviation to journalism. There are literally hundreds of people all around the world who count Benet as a mentor. Um, and uh, she is the aviation queen. She's really the travel queen. She goes by the aviation queen, but honestly, she's the travel queen. Um, and uh, I, I really think that uh, you're going to get a lot from Benet's uh, presentation today as well. Uh, she, will, uh, she has her finger on the pulse of travel, and I look to her for advice all the time. So Benet, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and Art Gazzetti uh, from the American uh, Public Transportation Association. Um, Art is, uh, I think he's the third person that I met when I started this job in 2014. Uh, and he's uh, right now a vice president for mobility initiatives and public policy at the American Public Transportation Association. Um, and I, I look to art for uh, guidance on all things transit, uh, all things public transportation related. Uh, he, he does a lot of the same kind of work that we do in a slightly different space. Um, I rely on his counsel uh, often. And uh, if I'm right, Art, um, you, you also can, you came to us from, from uh, New Jersey Transit. Uh, I think is that right? It was I, uh, I, were... along the way. I, I, I spent time in New Jersey Transit and also the transit system in Pittsburgh. Transit. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So uh, again, I I consider Art a, a, a friend and, and colleague, and certainly uh, all three of these folks uh, I have turned to for advice over the years. So now we're going to turn for your, your advice and share it with the with the greater world. So Benet, Joe, Art, thank you so much for for being here. 
Um, so let's talk about the restoration of our transportation network. I think the, we've spent a lot of time uh, trying to convince folks that, no, we're not going to just mothball all the trains and no, we're not going to have to stop flying anymore. We're just all going to stay in our houses for the rest of our lives. Um, I mean, we are seeing travel rebound, uh, but it's doing it kind of unevenly, right? I mean, transit, um, the Northeast Corridor, commuter rail, they all seem to be having a harder time kind of, you know, getting their, their footing back than say the airlines uh, and uh, Amtrak's long distance routes. I mean, demand against all use cases is constrained. I mean, Amtrak is booking only 50% of their capacity. Um, a lot of folks are reducing frequencies and their service suspensions. Um, so that's, that's part of it. But some of it also seems to be a, a difference in sort of the demand across uh, sort of those, those areas. Could, you guys have any thoughts on that? What do you think accounts for those differences? And do you think the uneven recovery is a long-term feature or more of a short-term feature? Um, and I'm not sure uh, who wants yeah, to- but I'll, I'll jump in quickly on that. And okay. Just to make a couple, uh, uh, try to make them concise comments and, and certainly uh, uh, blending with the, with the panel. Um, but one is that, for, first of all, you're right. It's, um, you know, the bus, for example, within the transit community, bus has recovered uh, quicker than rail. In fact, some bus routes never, never lost ridership, you know, carrying essential workers all throughout the pandemic, keeping their city economies functioning, uh, transit workers among the heroes of the pandemic. Uh, rail, you know, th there's two sides of the question uh, on, you know, again, on the commuter rail side, et cetera, uh, light rail. Uh, it's the, the personal desires, but it's also the employers, uh, the economics on the employers end. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of people not wanting it. The downtowns still aren't open in, in most places, and that's where, um, that's where the riders are going. Uh, so it's going to de depend on that. Uh, let me make one thing. Um, through uh, one observation through history. And that's that this is not the first pandemic. There have been pand pandemics throughout the century. And since no one knows exactly what the recovery is going to be like, I think a lot of it will depend on how employers see the economics going forward. Uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic on that. But the <clears throat> all the pandemics in history mostly have ended up better than where you started. A lot of times the um, there's been uh, prosperity, uh, uh, social movement, and positive change th uh, through all of the pandemics. The pandemic of 1918, 1919 led to historic fact, peak years of transit ridership, largely on the streetcar network, and the uh, city recovery in the roaring 20s. Uh, so while no one knows right now uh, what is exactly going to happen, uh, I think if we look to history, uh, when uh, downtowns begin to uh, open back, uh, we will we will see the return of transit riders. Janae, you're unmuted. Did you want to go next or Joe? Yes, actually, thank you. Um, and I wanted to say a special hello to all of you. Um, I really enjoyed my year working at the Rail Passenger Association, um, and it actually made me more attuned to rail issues, which I have carried forward with me um, at the Point Sky. What I would say, I'm gonna look at the air transportation part. We have found that people have all this pent up travel demand. And as they're getting their vaccines, people are just booking trips. They are out there. Um, we just did a story about if you're planning to go on a trip for uh, Memorial Day, it's too late. We're seeing airfares going up. We're seeing um, seats selling out. We're seeing higher TSA throughput. So on the travel, on the air travel side, it's definitely going up. I went to Chicago this weekend. Um, BWI is the airport I fly out of. Um, uh, the TSA checkpoints were both crowded both ways. Um, I took, I believe in public transportation, I took the um, L train from O'Hare to my airport. Yes, you um, did. I did, um, and it was pretty crowded. Um, I was pretty surprised. Um, downtown Chicago seems to be open again. I mean, it's not 100%, but 
Um, I went to the Art Institute this weekend and it was packed. I mean, they had lip, they had social distancing and everything, but it was sold out. So I think that people are getting out and I think that demand is only going to get um, bigger as we get into the summer. Joe? Jim, good to see you. Thanks for the invitation to join you, you in the group today. Um, Art Benet, pleasure. Uh, one of these days we'll be back in person here soon. Um, so, so the Greater Washington Partnership is a civic alliance of the leading employers from Baltimore to Richmond. And we've been pulsing both our board companies, but also the larger business community um, since last summer. And, and there's a high level of uncertainty. I don't think that's gonna shock anybody at this juncture. I think the end is in sight um, and we can start to make uh, guesstimates of when the end is, is coming, but in terms of the pace and the scale of the recovery or the return yet to the office is still yet to be seen. I think um, the vaccine rollout has been relatively successful uh, in recent months. And I think that that success is going to speed up um, the likely return of folks uh, to the office this summer, uh, certainly into the fall. But there are some, some challenges that folks are gonna face. And I think most importantly, the comfort level or the level of understanding or, uh, that employers have um, had uh, where able in terms of remote work capacity, those employers that have learned that remote work is something that can be done and done done well, I think that we're gonna to continue to see an elevated um, rate of remote work going forward. The question becomes at what elevated rate? Is it one day a week where they used to have zero days a week or is it three days or a full five days? And then what's the percent uh, look like across the total workforce? I think there are benefits that come to that, um, but, but what does that mean for a transit system uh, writ large uh, if, say on a Monday and a Friday here in this region, only 50% of the regular office workers are coming in. There's trickle effects of you know, um, retail or restaurants serving amenities or entertainment in our, in our central cities and our central business districts. How does that impact uh, those communities? And I think we're just now starting to grapple with that question. I don't think that anybody has a firm understanding of the challenges that it, that it will face. I don't, think that it's necessarily long-term uh, to your question, Jim. Uh, I think that the next five years is gonna be shaky. Uh, I think the question becomes what do employers decide to do? I was at, on a conversation earlier this morning with a few company leaders on corporate relocations. I think heading into the pandemic, um, corporations that had the ability and the wherewithal were choosing places one of their priority factors and where they were locating next to a transit stop, a transit oriented development type of uh, amenity rich place uh, to attract talent, uh, also to attract a diverse uh, talent pool. Um, I think going forward, I don't think that the sense of place is gonna be gone, but I think we're gonna see a little bit more, and this is just my guesstimate now, a little bit more wide use of satellite offices, right? Where you don't have one HQ ruling them all, but maybe you're, you're having a few more satellite offices with a, a diffuse workforce and fewer folks coming in all the time. What does that mean um, to our commuter rail stops that maybe have been underutilized in terms of uh, transit oriented development and the like, or more of our transit stops on, on the, uh, outer edges of, of our system. I think this region, uh, we've got many stations, fortunately, got a great opportunity, but I, I, I to answer the question, I don't know if there's a, a firm uh, path forward, but those are those are my early assessments. Hmm. So it, it, you you kind of set the table here, Joe, for me to, to go into, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about is, of course, in DC, I mean, Amazon was pretty clear that transit was a requirement um, for their search for HQ2. Um, and, but, but, you know, large corporations are kind of getting involved generally. Uh, you know, Microsoft is pushing hard on high-speed rail in the Pacific Northwest. So it's not just limited to that. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm certainly Greater Washington Partnership is, it's an excellent example of how this kind of comes together. So has that, do you think it's shifted the way that businesses think about the need for transportation? I mean, you, you touched on it a little bit. Um, that the idea was to kind of get 
you know, focus on amenities that would attract employees uh, and, and attract talent. Personally, I think that part of what, what will drive a return is exactly that, that, you know, you can only sit in your home office so much. People, people miss going out to lunch with their colleagues, right? I mean, people, it, it's, not, it's about more than just the office. Um, and I mean, that's, that's kind of my, my view on it. But I wonder how are businesses thinking about this? And, and you know, I'll, I'll open it to all of you, of course. But, uh, but Joe, I know that's where, where you spend most of your time. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that your, your hypothesis is correct. We're all ready to go see people, hug people, you know, yes. like where, where yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think that that, for many, I don't think that that uh, want is going to be five days a week anymore, though. I, I, yeah. I do think that when and where um, employees are offered the ability to uh, have a few days remote work flexibility, um, I think we're going to see more of it. I think it's going to be a bit of a calling card for competitiveness too, as if uh, employers revert back to five days a week at the desk, you know, other employers I don't think are going to follow that mold right away at least. And, and I, it could be a competitive challenge then in terms of keeping talent. I think we're going to see a great shifting of folks that are looking for new jobs coming out of this that maybe didn't move over the last year because of, um, uh, certain decisions, fam familial or, or comfort. Um, but I, I would say em employers are, I believe, going to be more flexible in terms of what it means to be where where you work and, and when you work potentially. Um, but I, you know, I think it, it all comes down to the space and the or, or the frequency and the scale um, in this region. Roughly about sixty percent of our our workforce are could be remote work eligible. And if you know all 60% of that workforce were able to work from home one day a week or two days a week, that's significant and a, and a potential reorganization of our economy uh, and, and the demands on the system. And I think you know, that question, I don't think we're gonna go that far, but we were already a pretty high remote workforce pre-pandemic at about 5% on a given day. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're gonna break 10 to 15% at least for the next few years coming out of it. Mm -hmm. I, I, Jim, if I could, I'd, I'd like to uh, jump, uh, tie on to sure. uh, those comments. It, you know, one is that we're, we will come back differently uh, for sure. Uh, so we just have to be smart in planning for that. Already there were, there's so many ways that there were pre-pandemic trends that have been accelerated. For example, uh, the monthly commuter pass on, on commuter railroads. We were seeing for the last uh, few years that the trends aren't the same on, on monthly passes because many times people are taking Friday off working at home from, from Friday. So the monthly pass, uh, at least on many, maybe not commuter rail is, is probably not the most specific example, but in general, uh, the transit monthly pass was the economics were, were, were changing. Uh, another thing you're seeing changes on commuter rail, many saying, well, maybe it's not all about the peak. Maybe it's about these regional rail concepts where services provided uh, throughout the day and already SEPTA in Philadelphia is one system uh, among others. Uh, many are thinking about it, but SEPTA has already taken uh, affirmative steps uh, uh, towards that. I would say an overriding factor, and I'm proud, <laughs> I'm proud to say this, is that Congress and cities and the administration have invested in transit uh, to be there, right? When uh, to help facilitate the economic recovery and to be there in place. Um, they, they, they see the importance of it and they don't want transit to wither and weaken uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the, the three COVID relief bills have all been strong on that. But the final point I would like to make circling back to Joe's main core thought there, I, I think the economics we have to be mindful of. If the employers can save a buck by having people work out of their you know, their, their dens in their house, uh, they're gonna be inclined to do that. But I would say there's a reason why there are skyscrapers in downtowns, and that's that there are economic advantages uh, to having work environments that way. So if we show that no, you know, there's an economic advantage to be together, um, that will win the day. Um, I, would, I would say um, I've worked from home 
um, in Baltimore since 2014. So this is old hat to me. But a lot of my coworkers at the Point Sky didn't. Our offices are based in New York City. Right before the pandemic, we moved into this really beautiful, fancy building on Fifth Avenue. Um, barely had time to use it before the pandemic hit. Um, a lot of the people in our office have moved permanently. They've left New York. They took that opportunity. Um, I was the only one who had a team that was all remote. So when our parent company told everybody to stay at home, I had to help write that handbook. And I think that people have gotten used to this now. And I think another thing that has happened is, you know, a lot of the jobs that we're listing now, they're remote. So we're actually getting a talent pool that we wouldn't have gotten before because people didn't want to move to New York or move down to Charlotte where our parent um, company is located. So um, I agree with Joe and Art. I think there's gonna be a lot more flexibility with employers about this, but I also firmly believe um, that public transportation will still be needed. We have a lot of people who are doing jobs that can't be done remotely. So um, it's gonna be really important to make sure that the public transportation system is still in place. So it's interesting. I mean, I from, oh, did I cut you off? I, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I think about, um, uh, you know, the Department of Labor says that 38% of Americans are knowledge workers. Um, and we do have a higher concentration, certainly in the DC area. Um, but I, I'm intrigued by the idea that maybe we start to, our, our rail systems start to look like the RER in France, right? Where you have this more of a regional uh, kind of build up. Yeah, exactly, Joe. I'm, I'm going, oh, let's, let's do that. Um, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm intrigued by the idea that, you know, we might see little pockets of additional transit-oriented development pop up around what we're typically suburban kind of just, you know, platforms. That, that's an interesting thought. And, and so that, that might change the nature of it as well. I mean, again, personally, I see this, you know, there are so many things that go with working from home um, for those who are not used to it, like Benet. Um, I mean, I, 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 I've started calling it living at work where people think it's okay to, to do something at six in the morning or at 10 o'clock at night while well, you're home. And, and so the, the, the boundaries just begin to blend um, I think people don't don't want to live that way for you know an extended period of time. And I and to go back to what we were saying earlier, I I think people do want to have lunch with their colleagues. I think people do want to have those sort of serendipitous conversations in a hallway where there's some project that you're working on and you just happen to share it with someone who's not involved, and they say, "Oh my goodness, I actually did that two years ago. Let me show you this." And so there's that that. Again, that, that serendipity that you can't recreate um, on Zoom like we're trying to do here today. Um, and, and I think the last time I had lunch with Benet was probably six months before the pandemic. And Joe, it's been a long time since we've been able to get together. Art, I think I, you and I got each other uh, during an RSAC meeting, but that was just before the pandemic. It would be nice to actually meet with my colleagues. And, and I do think there's that, that sort of demand, that pent up demand. Um, and I think that pent up demand is, is flowing also into what I'll, sort of, I'll call sort of the long distance travel. Um, whether we're seeing, as, as Benet was saying, the increase in the airline demand or on the long distance trains. I mean, try to book a sleeper right now. Um, my, my, my youngest son was considering booking a sleeper out to Denver for next week. He can't get it. He's gonna he's gonna go coach because that's all he could get. Um, and uh, so I guess it's that idea of revenge travel. Um, have we heard of this term, revenge travel? Um, this idea I, that that I don't. Like I'm gonna travel. travel. I know Benet doesn't I like it. Hate that is term. it is it a real thing though, Benet? And and is it gonna spill out into into rail? Do you think? Um, I. It is a real thing, but I also feel that, you know, as more and more people get their vaccines, it's going to become less of a real thing um, because, you know, I'm vaccinated. So I felt great going to Chicago this weekend just because I could. 
Um, but if you had asked me this six months ago, yes, there would have been a lot of flowback. But I think as more people get their um, vaccines, we're going to see all modes of transportation, people just wanting to get out. We just did a story called Carpocalypse. Um, car rental um, rates have shot through the roof. Um, I mean, just like many, like small little compact donut wheel cars are going for 250 plus a day. Um, so, you know, I think people are looking, they're, they're, they want to get out there. So there's less of that revenge travel stigma out there right now. Mm -hmm. I, and Jim and, and uh, Benet, if I could jump in with one point, uh, because I think it's time to interject this now. There's a, you hear this phrase that I'm all over, build back better. And I think there's, you know, there's the opportunity to come back stronger, more resi resilient, more sustainable, more customer centric, more equitable. Uh, but there's also a chance, it's not a guarantee we're going to come back better, right? I mean, there might be an inclination for there be a, bo a boom in, in road travel. And uh, I think that would be a terrible outcome of the pandemic. So I think we do need a policy framework that is going to uh, not encourage, uh, right? Driving, parking, uh, low cost. Uh, uh, so we have to make sure we end up back uh, on our feet here. Right? Um, otherwise there is a threat. So I've I'm got two, two thoughts. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim, if you have. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Please. I think there's one one item that kind of Art hit on the head earlier and, and gets at something Benet was saying about kind of equity and thought of the services that are being provided at the rapid transit level at the at the, the regional scale. Um, in this region, the Washington metro area, 80 nearly 80% of the trips are for non-work-related trips, yet our transit system primarily serves the commuter. And that was set up by design in terms of when the transit system was created, serving the federal workforce coming into the city and out in the evening. Um, but we've got an opportunity, I think, you know, due to the pandemic and, and potentially an elevated scale or, or, or rate of remote work, thinking about our transit system and its services providing, you know, access for folks at all hours of the day, not so peaky providing better service for folks to be able to get to grocery stores or to to a, uh, a doctor's appointment or other, you know, cultural amenities that they have instead of having to wait 15 minutes, 20 minutes during the middle of the day or not have service on the nights and weekends, we can reevaluate where our operating dollars are going and provide different types of service that will serve 80% of all of our trips. It's kind of boneheaded that we aren't thinking like that, but it's a profit decision that we've made in terms of you know, peak fares versus off peak, et cetera. And so I think that is an, an excellent opportunity, not just to reevaluate the services being provided, but do it in a more equitable way for more of our, our, our trip purposes. I think, you know, shifting to the uh, future of travel outside of a region, I, I think it will be interesting. And this is one that I've been kind of like thinking through in my head is what will employers do for, for holidays, right? Where someone's taking a vacation can we take the whole month of August and go work remotely for two weeks then take two weeks off? So, you know, we can spend a month in Bar Harbor, Maine or France or, you know, right down the, the street at your beach house if you so choose. If you no longer have to be right uh, next to the office as often or as frequent. And I think that can create a different type of travel demand and, and longer stays instead of short, you know, half week to a week. And, and I, I've got a hunch we're going to see more of that uh, type of remote work for a set period of time for the full week or a month, um, giving folks greater flexibility to explore and travel. I have to agree with Joe on that. I can tell you just in the past year, I've actually been at my family home in San Antonio, Texas, more than I've been here in Baltimore. Um, Asa de Wilson. Yes. <laughs> and in October, um, if everything works out, I'm spending the month in India. Uh, my best friend from college, her husband is the acting ambassador there. So I will be working from India and I will also be taking some time off. And this is um, something we've seen not only in our own office at the points guy, but just with um, our readers, we have data points of people going all over the place. Um, one of our editors is living in 
in on a ranch in Montana. Um, we have people who have gone um, further down Texas. We have people in the Pacific Northwest. We have people in California wine country. Um, we have the flexibility with these knowledge jobs to really do our jobs from anywhere, as long as we have our laptops and an internet connection. So I definitely see that as a trend going forward. So I wonder, does this, it feels like this could go in one of two directions though, right? I mean, it, does it, does this potentially threaten our ambitions to have cleaner, more efficient travel? Because we're, we're, as you said, you could sit in Montana instead of, does that maybe take out the, 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 the emphasis that we would want to have on investing? Uh, I mean, that would be my fear. Uh, and, and what does that do for better access <coughs> to, you know, to housing or transit-oriented development? I mean, we've seen a lot of great development sort of take place around that model. I, I, Jim, just a, a quick uh, thought on that is that um, you're right. There is a, we're at a time that those judgments have to be made. Uh, we have another opportunity here to link what we're doing on passenger rail, we're talking about transit a lot here, but certainly passenger rail is central to this, uh, to link our transportation investments to those bigger goals, uh, sustainable environment, equity, et cetera. It seems like that is very much in the discussion uh, this year and taking it down from the federal level to the state level, and, and Joe, this is right in your wheelhouse, you hear Virginia and Maryland talking about running through trains, uh, through the states. Uh, it's thinking of things in a whole different way. You have Virginia making uh, you know, it's just exciting investments here at the peak of the pandemic to say this is the way we see our future. Just one other stat I'll throw in here. Um, you know, APTA monitors the transit ballot measures every year judiciously. And when you ask the community straight up uh, on a ballot measure, do you want more transit in your community? Do you want more rail in your community? And by the way, it's not free. You have, you have to be willing to raise your taxes to do it. And last year we were a little bit wondering, it's, it, are the questions going to be viewed in a different lens? And it is the absolute fact that 48 out of 53 times the public said, yes, we want that more uh, additional investment in transit, even at the at the heart of the pandemic. So there's just a few positive thoughts. Okay, so just uh, for everyone's uh, info, we're, we're launching an interactive poll uh, during the session here today uh, with for all of you to uh, about your commuting in kind of the, the new normal or the, what I'll call the next normal. Um, so the poll will stay open, um, but we would love it if, uh, if you would uh, hit up the poll and I'm seeing it happen right now is always fun um and i hope my panelists can see the poll as well are you seeing that yes excellent okay so less more one day less same as before i see the same as before kind of duking it out with no commute up oh, i see one day less seems to be clustering for those that do commute. It seems to be clustering around either same as before or one day less. Um, which uh, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Yeah, Jim, what, how do you interpret no that? commute? What, what does no commute mean? Does that mean so, people- So I think, I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's the members of our, our, uh, our board and council here who are possibly retired or already work from home oh, so they don't Thank have you. a commute. Okay. It's not that they foresee no commute. It's just that they don't commute. Right? They don't commute. So mm -hmm. that would be me. <laughs> Our chairman speaks. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like it's clustering around sort of same as before or one day less is sort of the majority uh, for those that do have a commute. Um, what, what do we think of that? Any, uh, any impressions? I, I would have expected to see more than, than one day less, honest. That, that's kind of where I was expecting this to go. So I find that a little surprising, um, but possibly encouraging for our friends in transit. Yes. Yeah, I, I view this as, as, a, as another affirmation. Again, I'll, I'll say Congress, one bill after another is saying they want transit to be strong. And this is further affirmation. 
How about that? Well, okay. Um, well, listen, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I want to turn my attention a little bit to um, sort of the pandemic safety. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of scare talk early on in the pandemic about the subways, for example, you know, the spreaders. Well, it turns out subways were never really a factor. Um, do you, do, there's being safe and then there's actually feeling safe, which is separate. Um, I mean, do you think that people are feeling more safe, less, or, or are they still feeling unsafe? If that's the case, what can we do to make them feel safer, to make them feel like it is okay to return? Um, and at the same time, um, without engaging in, you know, what uh, my friend Alicia Trost at uh, BART calls hygiene theater. Um, it needs to be actually meaningful. What, what do we think about that, Pamela? I like that saying, hygiene theater. Um, when I was taking the train um, into Chicago, it was on the last stop. And as I was sitting there, they had a group of people coming in, um, uh, worker, um, CTA workers coming in um, and wiping down surfaces. And, you know, part of me was like, oh, this is, this is kind of nice. But the other part of me was, you know, uh, is, you know, is this really helping anything? And I'm kind of a germaphobe anyway. So even before the pandemic, I'd carry my wipes and my little can of Lysol spray. So um, I think, that, but I, that, that being said, I think there's a lot to be said about people feeling safe, even with the, um, with the pandemic um, theater. So that's, that's my thought. I think, you know, there's, there's, two driving factors as we move on. I think early on, there was a lot of trepidation of crowding, you know, what was or wasn't, you know, the spreading uh, uh, factors. Um, I think now we're pretty confident of what's going on and how to mitigate your risk. Most of the public, I would generally assume, uh, want to see a vaccine in their arm before they start to go into crowded places again. Um, it's at least the surveys that we found both from the employers and, and others as well. So the vaccine rollout is going to be really important to see folks actually come back if they have a choice, right? Some folks don't have a choice and they've been there. I think the other one that just, this is my own personal expectation is, is wearing masks are going to be really important. If you, even if you have a vaccine and you go on and you see, you know, 50% of the car full and less than, 10% of them wearing a mask. I think folks are gonna, at least in those early days, gonna be somewhat trepidatious to continue to take that, that transit yeah, option. So I, I think continued know. mask wearing is really important. Do you know where it's located? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Art? Yeah, well, yeah well, certainly what Joe said is, 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 is key. Um, and what Benet said is, is key too. The, let me say, the, and the, the state of the science has evolved a lot. I mean, we uh, have learned so much in the in the past year. Uh, the commuter railroads and other transit have adopted uh, standards, put a lot of time and effort into what is the standard kind of health and safety uh, guidelines that you need to do, disinfecting, etc., every day. Uh, you know, and and now we're thinking. You know, since the virus is airborne, uh, is the surface sanitation is important to the big scale we had. As we adapt those changing guidelines, uh, one thing we've done, and we had, a, by the way, uh, after a uh, mobility recovery and restoration task force appointed by our chair at the time, Noreen Fernandez, who is now the Federal Transit Administrator, and the task force was chaired by Phil Washington, head of LA Metro, who went on to had the Biden-Harris transition team on transportation. So a couple of good people there. Um, but one of the outcomes of that task force was a, a, a seal. So that if you go on a commuter train or a light rail train, um, streetcar, you see a seal there that shows that, hey, this transit system has adhered to the highest standards uh, or is committed to the highest standards in in health and safety. So I don't know, our, our members have said that's a visible sign to the public that we've at least uh, taken all the steps. I, I have to say, uh, since uh, last March, I've been involved in an ad hoc uh, pandemic task force uh, of um, uh, 
public health folks, public health engineers, physicians, um, epidemiologists, and a few others. Uh, I was brought on as the transportation uh, subject matter expert for this group of physicians and, and so forth. And early on, we were focusing very much on the airborne threat, <clears throat> the fact that this was an aerosolized viral threat. Uh, and so certainly from our point of view, we've, we've come ever closer to recognizing that uh, to the extent that we can maintain a multi-layered clean air defense uh, with, within indoor spaces and shared air, um, and then communicate that approach to the public to let them know that we are cleaning air, um, that there's uh, HEPA filtration, there's UV filtration, there's virus scavenging, there's all kinds of technologies um, which can be applied and taken together, you know, no one technology is the answer, but when you layer them together, you can create a shared air space um, that is not only uh, safe for the, the sort of post coronavirus environment, but, oh, by the way, flu is not going to be as much of a problem. Allergies are not going to be much of a, as much of a problem. There's a wider benefit. Um, I think one of the things that sort of sadly we, we learned out of the pandemic and the approach to clean air is that, you know, we have accepted a level of death and illness in this country from other things because we kind of felt like there was nothing to do about it. I mean, one of the things that's happened as the coronavirus has grown, one of the things that happened with, with masks and social distancing was we saw rates of flu come down a lot and flu kills people. So I think we've reached this, this place now where there's a more of an awareness of the importance of a, of a clean air environment in, in indoor spaces, in places where people share the air. And so to the extent that we can communicate that to the traveling public. Hey, we've got great air filtration on these rail cars. Hey, we've got, you know, great uh, systems in this waiting area or in this uh, station platform um, that I, I think we need to kind of get that message out to the traveling public. And I think the seal art is a great idea, um, you know, to kind of signal we're safe, we're clean. That's, I think that's terrific. Um, so I'm, I'm getting the, uh, the, the flag from, uh, from our folks here that, I'm, that we are running out of time. Um, I haven't seen a lot of questions in the, in the chat for the group. So I think what I'd like to do is to end on, on uh, one more question here. Um, you know, when I look at um, the different ways that rail operations take place, right? You've got Amtrak, You've got where I used to, to ride on the, the Virginia Railway Express, the Mark, um, the, all, all of these guys, um, they use the same tracks, the same rail yards, they terminate at the same station. Um, maybe someday they will incorporate through running. <laughs> um, but, they, but they all have different use cases, right? The Amtrak use case is different from VRE and it's different from Mark. So how interdependent are these regional and intercity rail services and what happens if one of them takes a longer time to recover than, than others? Did, what does that do to the overall approach? I'll just open it up to whoever wants to start. I, I, Jim, just a, a very quick point on that. And that's uh, to flag the point, the part that we're, as you all felt, well, no, this is a historic time for passenger rail. We've never, we've waited a lifetime, Jim, <laughs> to, yes. to have this level yes. of focus on passenger rail issues. Let's make sure it's viewed as part of a, a broader network that links to the public transit services, that links to commuter rail, and it's all part of a system. In fact, the backbone, right, of, uh, of this uh, mobility ecosystem. Yeah, I'll jump in and just say, you know, the interdependence of all of the, the, the rail, kind of the inner city freight um, is really, really important. I think, you know, Art hit it on its head. We've got a unique opportunity, maybe, knock on wood, a once in a generation type of federal infrastructure uh, play with somebody that is undoubtedly maybe the most knowledgeable rail president uh, we've had in, in years. Uh, and dedicated to to investments and, and making sure that Amtrak and other operations are, are up to snuff. 
I think, you know, the more and more folks, uh, our good friend Danny from Virginians for High Speed Rail might be on this. The more and more folks throughout the country and within your network can look to Virginia in terms of what Art, Art said of um, the historic deal that, that uh, Governor Northam struck with CSX, Amtrak, and VRE shows you know, what's possible when you have committed leaders and, and the funding and financing strategy to really transform rail. But that deal can't be done without all parties coming together. There's a very, very strong uh, interconnectedness and benef mutual benefit uh, for all those parties. Uh, and I think long term, you know, the future is bright uh, as you start to look at those shared shared benefits and shared investments in terms of what, what's possible. I think Joe and Art hit it right on the head. There's nothing else I can add. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, um, we are at the, the bottom of the hour uh, and I, I could keep going. Uh, first of all, I just, I miss everybody. This is, this is what it would be like if we were sitting outside having lunch together. So yeah. um, it, it's close, but, but still not quite there. I can't wait to see everybody in person. Thank you very much, uh, Art, Joe, Benet, for being here and helping us out with this conversation. Because I think it's important as our folks get ready to visit uh, uh, with their congressional delegations tomorrow and for the rest of the week, for them to understand and have a, a sense of, of kind of where where the where the industry is and, and where the sort of the how the patterns are starting to, to reassemble themselves. Um, so many other questions that are out there that we didn't get a chance to address. I know that, that folks wanted to know what might happen to rolling stock purchases based on the shifts in transit demand and so forth. Um, so as I as I you know said to some of the earlier folks, what I might do is take those the any written questions and fire them off and see uh, you know it, it, it's kind of a next best thing if anyone wants to respond to those. Um, but really, thank you for, for the three of you for being here. It, it's been great, and uh, it just it makes me miss being in person even more. Um, we're going to take a break. Uh, trying to, to break up the screen time so people don't uh, lose, lose their minds on the screen. Um, Joe, you're going to uh, set us up for what's coming next, which I think is pretty exciting. Yeah, so we actually have, uh, after our break, we'll be back at uh, quarter to 12. Uh, so thank, thank you, thank you, panelists. Uh, sorry to cut you guys off there. Uh, fan, absolutely. I, I hope everyone in attendance realizes just how how great it was actually to get the three of you together for this. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be back at 11.45 from our break uh, with our keynote speaker for the day. So uh, we'll uh, you'll hear my voice again uh, at five minutes and one minutes to go. So thank you. Joe, Art, Benet, thanks again. We'll see you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you again, Art.